Welcome to Slick Rides Garage. On this episode of Slick Rides Garage, I'm removing the engine from my 1997 Ford F-150 shop truck. I paid $500 for it with the engine partially disassembled and a yard sale of parts inside the cab. Needless to say, I'm expecting the worst. The seller said the truck was losing coolant and running warm for some time before suddenly losing oil pressure. He said he pulled over and stopped the engine within 30 seconds, only restarting it to drive it on and off a trailer. He also said the truck was running poorly, was hard to start cold, and idled too fast. After trying to repair the engine with limited tools, the seller gave up, and that's how I bought it. So after arriving at Slick Ride's garage, I removed the engine, put it on a stand, removed the timing cover, and found the camshaft synchronizer had seized. This stripped the driven gear and damaged the teeth on the drive gear. Since the camshaft synchronizer drives the oil pump, it also stopped turning. This caused a sudden loss of oil pressure. Often the chirp, chirp, chirp of a failing camshaft synchronizer is misdiagnosed as a squeaky serpentine belt or bad idler pulley. Next, I removed the cylinder heads and found this head gasket blown in two places and excessive rust in the water jacket. It looks like their solution for coolant loss was just add water. This tag on the engine block says it was remanufactured for Ford in 2001. The early 4.2 V6 intake manifold gaskets are known to fail and allow coolant into the combustion chamber. This can cause the engine to hydrolock and bend connecting rods if the engine is forced over in this state. The color here tells me coolant was entering the air intake stream while this port appears to have remained sealed. The intake manifold also shows coolant was bypassing the gasket. After loss of oil pressure, I thought the internals would be trashed, but they're in really decent shape. Good enough that one might be tempted to polish and reinstall everything after honing, machining the heads, and maybe a re-ring on the pistons. Even with a perfectly assembled engine, these early 4.2s were known for repeated failures due to design problems. I found every one of them on this factory rebuilt engine. In the auto industry, we call this pattern failure. Basically, a pattern failure is when a mass-manufactured item has components that fail often and repeatedly. As a general rule, a manufacturer improves the failing components to resolve the problem, and all mass-manufactured items are subject to pattern failures. This engine's Achilles heel was mainly gaskets and the camshaft synchronizer. Ford redesigned the problem gaskets in early 1997, but significant improvements didn't happen until 2001. Unfortunately, the direct interchange on my engine is 1997 to mid-1998. Direct interchange means an engine can be removed from one vehicle and installed into another in a mostly plug-and-play fashion. Since the early engine still uses similar style gaskets, they will be subject to the same pattern failure after completion of the repair. So with this in mind, I'm going to set some build goals. For my needs, it's a must to resolve all pattern failures and install an engine capable of going 10 years reliably. I also want the engine's electronic control system and components working right. Lastly, I don't want to spend any more than $1,500. Although the engine is factory rebuilt, needs minimal machine work, and the parts are available locally, the block and heads need extensive cleaning to remove rust, and the only parts available are still subject to the original types of pattern failure. The final nail comes when I find the cost of parts will exceed the budget. With all that's going against this project, one might be inclined to call time of death and send her to the salvage yard. But here at Slick Rides Garage, we're capable of advanced life support, and transplants are our specialty. Although the direct interchange is limited, the 4.2 liter V6 has been around since the late 1970s. After battling years of black eyes and pattern failures, the 2005 Ford F-150 4.2 liter V6 earned the title of most reliable truck ever built. Since changes to the block are expensive, Ford saved money by leaving the block alone when possible and improving the design of bolt-on items like heads, intake, and exhaust manifolds. In part, it's changes to these bolt-ons that determine the direct interchange. Now the question is, are the blocks similar enough I can take advantage of these later improvements? Using a 2005 to 2008 series engine in my 1997 truck looks like it would help me accomplish my build goals. The only way to answer that is with some research. After a look online, it appears the changes may be insignificant. Although the part numbers differ, the main features of the block appear mostly unchanged. 
a little more digging, and it appears most of the engine's internal components are the same from 1997 to 2008. So I went to carpart.com and searched for a 2005 to 2008 series engine to compare to my 1997. I found one just down the road at 160 Salvage in Nixa, Missouri. Now that I've taken some pictures and measurements for comparison, I'll take some time to evaluate the engine's condition. The oil fill cap, tube, and oil dipstick are clean. I also check the top of the dipstick for excess buildup or rust. This can indicate poor maintenance or engine problems, as can excess oil in the intake and exhaust system. The minor seepage from the gaskets isn't a concern for me since they're being replaced as part of the swap. This engine checks out great, so now it's back to Slick Rides Garage for some comparison and some good news. It looks like the changes to the block are minimal, and I think I can work with them. Even better, the timing cover and everything inside it, including the camshaft synchronizer and harmonic balancer, are the same as my 1997, and that will save me $250 on this build. I do have some concerns, though. The intake system is entirely different, so I wonder how adaptable the 1997 intake will be. Taking apart the replacement engine makes it mine, so after some risk assessment, I decided to move forward with the swap. So after unloading a very reasonable $500 for the engine, I unloaded it at Slick Rides Garage and started strong by cleaning it with my extreme detail process. This helps keep contaminants out of the engine during disassembly. I'll also do it under the hood and with the items I plan to swap to the 2005's engine. Finally, it's wrench time. I'll start by removing the plenum and intake, and that's where I discover my first problem. In 2001, Ford revised the coolant crossover design, making room for an improved gasket. The 1997's gasket has only one seal between the intake and coolant crossover ports and was one of its design flaws. The revised 2001 gasket has independent seals for both ports. For this to happen, Ford decreased the coolant passage size to increase the surface sealing area. This makes my 1997 intake incompatible. Except for the seal thickness, the 2005's intake gasket is identical to the 2001. Unfortunately, the 2005 intake is also incompatible with the 1997. I'm feeling a little bummed, but I'm not giving up. After more research, I learned the main difference in the 1997 and 2001 to 2004 F-150 intakes are coolant crossover port size, screw in plugs where I need coolant sensors, and an electronic intake manifold runner control, or IMRC system. So I took a trip to Buddy's U-Pool in Brookline, Missouri, and removed a 2001 F-150 intake for inspection. This series of manifold turned out to be the key. The 2001's manifold will allow the 1997's intake plenum to bolt to the top, while the smaller coolant crossover port will adapt perfectly to the 2005 engine. The electronic IMRC system uses the same mounting points as the 1997's vacuum dash pots. Lastly, once the screw-in plugs are removed, my coolant sensors will thread right in. With the 2001's intake now clean, I turned my attention to the gaskets. Since the 2001 and 2005 gaskets are similar, I decided to use 2008 model year gaskets to take advantage of all possible revisions. It looks like they'll fit just fine. But I'm going to be careful with the installation. I'm centering the intake on the engine by measuring and marking the center of the valley deck on the block and intake. Now I'll set the intake on these lines, center a few intake bolts on both sides, which will center the intake longitudinally. I'll mark this position across the intake and cylinder head. Now that the intake is installed, I'll repaint, then install the 1997 valve covers and turn my attention to the oil pan. After removing the 2005's oil pan, I went to swap the 1997's to it and ran across another problem. Apparently, the main bearing caps were changed at some point, requiring a deeper oil pan. My 1997's pan was too shallow and wouldn't bolt up to the 2005 engine. Now there's a concern the deeper 2005 oil pan may not clear the front differential on my truck, so I bolted the 2005 oil pan to the transmission calculated the installed position using the motor mounts, and fortunately, there will be plenty of clearance. Finally, I can install the accessories to the engine. But wait, we have another problem. The 1997's knock sensor is piggybacked to the coolant drain plug on the right side of the block, and neither will fit the 2005's engine. 
After some more research, I learned the knock sensor was changed and relocated to the back of the left cylinder head in 1999. There are two solutions to this problem. One is to drill and tap the hole in this boss to accept the 1997's drain plug. This sounds like the solution until one learns the sensor was changed due to problems in service. The option I'm choosing is to obtain the newer knock sensor and relocate it. So after cutting off the original knock sensor's plug, I opened the wiring harness in four places and extracted the wires to the knock sensor in each location, threading them back through the harness each time. This is to make sure only the correct wires are relocated. Once they're at the right exit point on the harness, I'll install the late model plug wire to wire and crimp them together. Once the splices are covered, I'll add a piece of piping, tape everything up with electrician's tape, and secure the plug to the harness with some zip ties. So after hours of ups and downs, research, and wrench time, the 1997 accessories are all installed on the 2005's engine. Did you notice the 2005 exhaust manifolds are still installed? After changing out the EGR pipe and widening the holes in the header flange, everything bolted up, and the engine is now back in the truck. Alright, it's January of 2016. The engine's been in for a year. I've got 5,000 miles on her. Let's fire it up, see how she runs. <laughs> 